Okay, good morning, good morning. A lot noisier than it was on Thursday, right? We had silence at the beginning of the last stream. It's Saturday morning, there's delivery trucks. You can hear one noise. There's a delivery truck just off camera here. It's pointing the other way today. I think they're getting ready for a busy, busy weekend here. It's uh, Today it's not raining right now, but it has been raining like crazy the last few days. It's been very wet. I had told you I was going to go to Ome this weekend. That was the plan. I chatted with one of our staff members there yesterday. She says the river is way up. There's no way we can see any fish. I can't get in the river there to set up the camera. So just whatever. Let's just cancel it. Ne good weather next week. Let's get out there again next week. Plus also I have a tad work to do here. So we'll have a normal, normal stream here. Annabelle's asking, did I enjoy the sauna experience? Well, no, <laughs> I, I didn't hang around, of course. So <laughs> I didn't hang around. That's the worst possible, because we can't use the fan. No, we, we normally, of course, use fans. We've got, normally, we have the windows open at both ends of the third floor. We get a good breeze going through. But when you're hanging up the wet paper, we can't do it that way. So uh, unfortunately, they seal off the first room. The girls use the air conditioner in the printing room. And whoever's doing sizing, it was me before, now it's Aoyama-san. We just put up with it. It's okay, you know, it's over in an hour or so. Just keep working and you're good to go. It's not that bad. We're okay. I, we've talked about this before. I, I'm not complaining about this heat. I'm the only guy in the room here, in the building. Everybody else complains. I, I like this feeling of being hot and then too hot and then it comes back down and autumn is so nice. And then you get, in winter, it's freshening to be cold, and then it's too cold, and oh my god. And then, you know, we open some prints first. This is from Chiharu-san. We're going to carve. Today's stream is going to be a carve. We're coming back to our block. Tom's asking, is the paper out? No, there's no paper out, because nobody is here today. Ishikawa-san is the, usually the weekend person. She's off. She and her husband, I believe, have gone up to their little summer place. She's taking her summer holidays. What's this? It's from Chiharu-san. What did we send her? I can't remember. I don't remember what we sent her. Let's have a peek. Yes, nice one, nice one, nice one. This is another, I don't think this has been out of stock of our catalog for, for a couple of years. We haven't had this one in stock for a couple of years. This is one of the block sets I carved in my own Surimono albums. They came into our Mokohankan catalog, and we've been just busy printing other stuff, so we haven't got any, uh, didn't get around to this one, but Chiharu-san had some time, so I sent her the blocks. And it's, uh, it's got uh, silver, if I can find the right shiny thing. The lines here are all metallic pigments. There you go. The metallic pigments on the stones and on the waves. The waves are in silver. I can't find the right angle. Can't find it there. Very nice, very nice. I had better remember to turn it on. It's probably turned off in our catalog. Just a second, one moment here. This, I believe, needs to be turned on. One sec. I haven't checked them yet, but it's pretty obvious they're going to be okay. A lot of them are going to be okay. What's the number? Two sixty. It's marked as reprinting, and we have to turn it on right now. Should have done this before the stream started. Hang on. It's marked as reprinting. It is now going to be available. And if 
printer, we need to mark it as Chiharu Kawai. Okay, sorry for that. There's no border, it's gonna get trimmed. So it's a bleed print, so the paper is too large and it will be trimmed right to the color. This will be a bleed. The finished print will look, it will have a border like this. The print will, will, uh, will not have a borderline. And again, they're too damp, always. We talk about this every time she sends us prints, especially in the summer. They're too damp. Either her building or her house is, is damp. And these are not dry enough. If I leave them like this, there's a good chance they'll go moldy. So after the stream today, I'll get upstairs. I'll put them in our normal drying boards. These are too damp. Yeah, the border is indeed weird. Yes, thank you. It's a surimono. It, it originally was a real surimono. I think it's, I forgot, is it gakute? I don't remember. I, I put it away already here. Is it gakute? I think. It's a surimono from maybe about the 1840s. I reproduced it in my surimono albums back in about 2002 or 2003. And the blocks slept for 20 years and we've now brought the blocks out and we're publishing it again under the Mokohankan catalog. Counter is late. <laughs> it's late. Okay, 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 okay. So is that if they condemn, oh, hi Luis if they condemn the building, what happens to the historic ceiling? This is an interesting question. We've chatted about this. See, there's two or three ceilings here up on the second floor that are historic. Historical? Historic. Of historic interest. They're of a type that was built in the 1960s, a very fashionable type of construction. Uh, not done anymore, nobody does it anymore, nobody knows how to do it anymore. And we have some, uh, some uh, historical ceilings here, and Rod's son is asking what happens to them. Normally they would just get destroyed. When this building comes down, they will just come down. I have a meishi somewhere that a guy left me. I hope I can find it a guy who's a member of some kind of architectural study group, and he went bananas when he saw these ceilings. This is years and years and years ago. And he said, if anything ever happens to this place you're renovating, call me, because we want these. They want to take out those two ceilings and preserve them somewhere, somehow. So I've got a name card somewhere upstairs in my files. Yeah, of a guy who does want to, uh, doesn't, what does want to keep these ceilings, so. Okay, let's get to it. We've done around the hair. I'm not going to do the face yet. We're going to keep uh, just keep moving along bit by bit. Well, how to preserve a ceiling? It's 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 all built in. The, the building is a concrete shell. It's concrete floors, concrete walls, concrete roofs. There's steel framing. It's it's early post-war steel framing, and then everything else was built inside that. So that ceiling could be taken down. It must be uh, fastened somehow up to the concrete. And just get up there and take it apart bit by bit by bit, and then, uh, and then do what you want with it, I guess. Yeah. So it's not structural in the building, it's something that was built inside the structure of our building. So it has no other, it's not supporting anything. So it could be taken out. Yeah, I myself too, you know, I'm, oh, this will never happen, but if it turned out that, you know, there's an earthquake here and this building gets uh, not usable, or if there was, if we were forced to leave, we're supposed to restore it to what's called skeleton state, back to the original steel structure. So we ourselves could actually take that ceiling with us if we were ever uh, pushed out of here.
think you'll notice the uh, Japanese summer sounds in the background, right? The, the bell next door is quiet right now because there's no breeze this morning. But you can hear the insects and you're hearing them from the temple garden. You know, the buildings in the background here, those buildings are on the edge of the temple garden. Ah, soka, soka. Camera, yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing after another, one thing not after another. Let's get some in. <laughs> bzz, bzz, bzz. Buzzard show. <laughs> I don't, we don't know what to do. You know, my mail, Karen, I guess, has been explaining what we were trying to figure. You know, when Dave needs to be alerted, you know, I have mail sounds, but my mail program is set for a five minute check. I don't want to set 30 second check on my mail, you know, although I guess what I could do is my email is normally a five minute check but it, we could do this that when I start carving here when I turn the stream on I could set my email temporarily to like a 30 minute check and then the mods know this special email address to use that would alert me <laughs> but I don't know <laughs> so we would then have like a, a one minute gap <laughs> I don't I don't know what to do, whatever. Actually, Karen, there is another solution, you know. You're using Skype, right? Well, it's possible to use Skype to make phone calls out to a normal phone number. And it's really, really cheap. You can phone a phone number in Japan for it's like, it's like three cents for the first 10 seconds or something like that. I don't even know what the number is. So another way, Karen, so we could do this is I could keep the shop phone, or the normal telephone. At the moment, our little, you know, our little clamshell phone, it's upstairs. But I could keep the clamshell phone here, and if you need to get me, just call me. <laughs> That's another way. <laughs> just phone me and say, Dave, uh, zoom in, please. That's perhaps the best way to do this, rather than try and alert me. Just call me. Twitch stream now open, taking your calls at 070-5011. <laughs> Order desk at the ready. Yeah, now that I think about it, that's the obvious solution for this problem. Just phone me. Someone says Skype, is that functioning? I use Skype all the time. I use Skype. Why not normal Skype? Normal Skype, I can't use normal Skype right now because the audio I know, can't be split between. You know, OBS has taken over the audio and video in this computer. And if I tried to use Skype, I can't get an audio connection with it. We've tried to, we've tried doing this. So, so but just Skyping, Skype out to a normal telephone. And yeah, the, the three ring and hang up are just one. It's called here, it's called Japanese wangiri. It just Even if just the phone rang, that would tell me, oops, it's probably Karen. So it wouldn't have to be any charge. One ring and just hang up.
We have had Skype calls before on a, the older Mac that I have. It was possible. This one is not. Although having said that, there is. We are actually trying to get that set up at the moment because for the AMA coming up with me and Jed, we're going to do the UQA Heroes 10th Anniversary AMA. Is it next week or the week after? and we are going to patch in Skype to the Twitch stream here and we have actually found a way to do that but it needs to hack Skype to make it uh, recordable there is a way to do it and we, we have actually started testing this one so. I didn't get that nicely, come on, nice taste here Dave So yes, actually Skype can be fed into a Zoom, uh, into a Twitch stream. remember if there's any specific news we were supposed to talk about today. Today's Saturday, so we won't be having any guests. I am a son won't be here. Hosan Hassan won't be here. I'm here by myself for the weekend this time around. Oh, there was one piece of news. I know uh, there's a link for you. There's a link for you. I got an email, oh, I didn't even know, like four, five, six, seven, eight months ago from somebody who was making a video for a project he was doing, and he said, can I use your, some of your images of your woodblock prints in the video? And these were the images of the beautiful Hiroshige prints that we have. You saw some similar ones on, on the Twitcher stream a few weeks ago. I said, sure, whatever, go ahead, use the images. You know, be nice, put me a little credit at the bottom or something like this, go ahead, use the images. And then I heard nothing from the guy for months and months and months and months and months. Then about a week ago, he said, hey, we're almost ready. The video is almost ready, and uh, this the, this morning I got an email from him. It's up and running. The video we made that used your images is uh, up and ready, and then he gave me a link to it, and I followed the link, and it's kind of strange. The link jumps to a magazine called Prog, and it's a magazine that is uh, devoted to progressive rock, and. In there, there's one of their writers, I guess that's the connection, has created this video which uses our Japanese woodblock prints. The video itself is not a happy video. It's about, it's about dementia and somebody is studying the prints. Well, no, no point in, in telling you the story. There's the front page of the magazine. If you scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, look for the story that comes from the guy called uh, Boozer Cruiser. There's an item there about Boozer Cruiser and dementia, and that's the video that uses our woodblock prints, and it's all wrapped up in the magazine Progressive Rock. I mean, just whatever, things go round and round and round, so. <laughs> No, no, as it's not really a happy video, I think. It's, it's about the, the descent into dementia, and one of the ways they, they, this guy is tracking the descent is by his looking at his woodblock prints and his collection. So, there it is. That's the one there. Vivid KP has got it here, so... Uh, so. so, sure, if somebody wants to use our images, of course, I have no trouble with this at all. We always say yes. You know. It's not my images, it's Hiroshige's work from, from 150, 60 years ago. But when I saw the magazine there, you know, I, I scrolled through just this morning before I got up to, to, to do the stream here, I scrolled through the magazine and boy, it brought back some memories, you know. Because when Dave here was 23, 24, he was fooling around with a bunch of other kids, a bunch of other friends, and we had a little band, we called it Nuance. And we covered a bunch of, we covered Kansas, we covered some Boston, not progressive rock ready. Carry on my wayward son, every piece when you were done. We had great fun. We were so, so, so bad. 
one of the eternal things I'm grateful for that, that YouTube and, and little video didn't exist back in the 1970s because I do not want to hear that now. My God, we were so bad. Side cut in. I'm skipping around here. I should be more more uh, logical with this. Say, so Dave, what are you doing this morning? Well, I'm uh, I'm going to carve a bra strap, I think. Yeah, the font too. Maruku san, are you here? I haven't written to you yet, actually. I learned about that this morning. The new video, the video we're just talking about from the progressive rock people, they use the Hasegawa font that was uh, we and Maruku san, the, the young man in Finland, Finland, uh, put together. So that was cool. It's nice to see the, the Hasegawa font out there in the wild, and I think it works. I think it looks very, very, very nice. <coughs> I'll have to drop him a line. Um. I would be so happy if that, you know, over the years, if that came to happen, that that Hasegawa font just got, made, it goes out there and it gets used bit by bit, more and more. And if it became gradually recognized as a, as a real font, you know, with a name that people would recognize and stuff, you know. It's never going to take over from Times Roman or something, but it would be nice to see it uh, to see it become known, you know. So I've got to remember when I, at the end of this stream to to write to Marcus and let him know that it's out there, or maybe he already knows. Maybe they asked him. I don't know. another link we can maybe pop in because a lot of people perhaps don't know what we're talking about here. I think we'll need a link. Itani. Let me try this. I put the link in there, fonts, but the link might be just font. I don't remember. mokohankan.com slash font. Try that and have a look. It's in one of those two places. If you don't know the story we were, we were talking about there. block because we're just really starting I don't have any real sense yet of how the grain direction in this cherry is working 
when you're cutting with the knife, like we did a minute ago with the lines, mm -hmm. there is grain, you know, if you're going cross grain or with the grain, but you don't know whether how, how the grain is uh, diving into the wood. It's not until you start using the chisels like this that you see. And it's going to look like the grain is going to be this way, that when I'm clearing, I have to move this way and come this way. It's not going to work. It may not be consistent across the whole piece of wood. I don't know. But as you move forward bit by bit, you pick up what's going on and where it is. And, uh, because I'm just starting the clearing here, I don't yet have a feeling for how the grain is running. Now I've got, I've got Kansas running, running, running in my head. <laughs> Carry on my wayward son. It's going to be stuck in here all day now. a real band. What it was, it was me plus a bunch of local high school kids. And after coming back from England in the early 1970s, I was floundering around, didn't know what to do with myself. And I spent some time teaching music to kids groups out in the Delta Ladner area near Vancouver. My dad had done it for years. And after he left and moved uh, to Australia, there was uh, somebody was needed to do this. So I, I spent some time teaching kids music groups out in Ladner. And one year, they got some kind of a parents group for this. They got some kind of government grant. I think there was a, a program called LIP, a Local Improvement Project or something. And the government was just handing out money to get stuff moving. It was probably a mini recession going on or something. I don't remember. Anyway, the parents group scored some money and we ran a group of summer classes. And I used to go out there on the bus or hitchhike out there, I can't remember, and, and taught these kids music. You know, we had a little group. And then when the, when the program folded after six weeks or whatever, it ran its course, the kids were like, hey, we want to keep going, we want to do something. And I don't even know how it started. That group of high school kids and I, we started a, a progressive rock cover band, <laughs> which we called Nuance. And I got to tell you, we don't have the idea that we actually were a band and could get on stage and blow explosives and stuff. It didn't work like it. It was just, we rehearsed. And, and I wrote, quote, arrangements, because we had a bunch of kids playing horns and stuff. I think there was nine, eight or nine or ten of us, I don't remember. A couple of saxes, trumpet, trombone, plus, you know, the usual, the usual setup, a keyboard guy, two guitarists, drummer. And we, we did covers of, of stuff like Kansas and Boston and whatever. And we were gloriously, gloriously, gloriously bad. And our downfall, one day, somebody had heard about us, and we got booked. We got asked if we would do a school dance. And it was some middle school. It would have been for a junior high school, a school dance. And it was a girls' school. It was some independent church group or something, and they had a middle school for girls, and they had a hop or a dance or something, and they hired us, and we were insane and said yes. And it was an absolute total disaster. They wanted the hop. They wanted to play rock around the clock and hop around and stuff. And we get up there, we, we break into some <laughs> my God, I'm glad there was no YouTube. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I want 
if any of them, although those kids would remember this. I wonder if I'll ever meet any of them again. They were high school kids then in the 1970s. So they must have been about, about 10 years younger than me or something. So I'm 70 now, so those people now would be 60. I remember some of them, Neil and Susan and Grady. <laughs> They were, the kids were okay. I was just, I didn't know what I was doing. I should never have been in that position. <laughs> A nightmare. So say what happened at the concert, the con what happened at the dance, I don't remember. We were just blind. There was lights. We had rented a sound system and rented some lights, and they were blinding us. And all I knew is there were just kids out there shuffling around, you know. We didn't even know. We didn't try and present stuff. We just basically just rehearsed the stuff we'd been doing. And the kids did whatever they were going to do, shuffle around the room or jump up and down or something. I, d I don't even know. It was chaos. I was playing bass, bass guitar. <laughs> But please, don't any, I'm not being modest when I say I was no good. You know, the people know me that I'm actually pretty good at a lot of stuff and I'm modest, oh, I'm not so good at that, when I was really a superstar. No, I was minus, I was zero, zero. I was zero, zero, absolutely. I could not do it, I shouldn't have been there, I shouldn't have been trying it, I didn't know what I was doing. I was absolutely no good, absolutely. And this is not modesty, false modesty, or real modesty, or anything. It was awful. It was one of the most gloriously awful noises that must have been ever made on the surface of this planet since the last meteorite destroyed the dinosaurs. The young piano player, Steve, you know, it'd be fun to chat with him. Steve Smedley, he was our pianist. Really, really nice guy. I think he's got the sheet music. <laughs> Still, <laughs> when, we, uh, when we split up, I think I ended up moving to Toronto. Maybe I can't remember what it all happened, the, the order of events, but I ended up moving out and I think I left him. We had a big deck of sheet music because it was, it was a prog rock band, so we needed charts. The, the horn players, trumpet, trombone, two saxes, they needed sheet music. So we had actual arrangements, which I had done for the group. You know. I think Steve Smedley still has them, or, or trashed them many years ago, of course. You know. What a year, 19, is it before I went to England? It might have been 1970.
<laughs> I sort of have mixed feelings. Half of me would like to hear that, and half of me says, no, you don't. <laughs> Not half of me. Some small, tiny part says it would be curious to hear that, and the the real memory says, "Oh no, it wouldn't be." You know. So. You see the spot we avoided in Shankar talked about the other day, there's a knot in the wood, and as we had planned it, it would have actually bumped into one of these lines here. So when I was pasting down the design, I had to make sure we pasted it down so that these lines wouldn't hit that knot. If I hadn't noticed it, we could have done it, and if it chipped out, just fixed the line, but it's better to avoid the problems before you start, obviously. But I do have to be careful now, in a minute, when I'm clearing this out, because that's a knot, it's rock hard, and it's really easy for me to get my chisel caught on it and break something else. And also, the wood could split. As I turn off this knot in a minute, the wood could split through out to some of the nearby lines. So this is a beep, 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 red alert danger place. Absolutely. Have I ever seen a knot intentionally incorporated into printing art? Yeah, the 20th century people, the, the group called Sōsaku Hanga, 
They did that all the time. They wanted to see the wood. They wanted to see wood grain. They wanted to, there was a, there was a, a big example. Hang on, let me see if, if I can maybe just pop this up inside a minute here, just a sec. I can remember the, hang on a sec. No, I can't see it. I know. I don't remember who. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. If you Google around, go. If you Google the group Sosaku Hanga, S O S A K U, Sosaku Hanga, uh, Google that and Google the word knot or something, and you, it'll come up. Some of those people used knots and wood grain in their work a lot. Here in the, the ukiyo-e style, we don't because for us we don't want to see the wood. This is a this is a big deal, you know. The ukiyo-e concept of art and, and, and printmaking and, and making stuff, the wood was just a, a tool that was used along the way. And we don't want to see the wood in the finished product. If we see the wood, it means we've failed. This is the, you know, this is what it is. The purpose is the print design. The purpose is not the wood. The wood at the time was the only suitable material for, for making the products, and that's why wood was used. And it did impart its characteristics. When we look at an ukiyo-e print, and when you see this finished print, it will have a tone and a feeling and a mood that comes from the wood. So the wood is in there. But if we can, in the finished print, if we can see, oh look, there's a wood grain, there's a piece of the wood, if we can see that, it's sort of a failure. In the ukiyo-e tradition, eh? now the modern workers, the sosaku people, they came along and said, that's hypocritical, let's see the wood. We are woodblock printmakers, let's see the wood in the finished product. And that was totally legitimate viewpoint. It's just not the same viewpoint as the traditional workers who were just using wood, as I said, as, as, a, as a means to an end. So through the 20th century, you see lots and lots of wood grain and stuff. But in the prints we publish at Mokohankan, 99.99% of the time, if you see the wood, it's because we haven't quite figured out how to do our job properly. Because we don't want to see that as part of the finished image. That is one hard little piece of wood. Be careful, Dave. So turn off the mic out there. We've got a heat stroke ambulance and we've got a vacuum cleaner. Let's turn off the outside audio for a minute. Although it's probably not gonna make a difference because the door's open. <laughs> so. Yeah, somebody's pointing out that in the old days there are vintage prints with visible wood grain. Of course, I know, it did happen. The, the famous Hokusai image of Mount Fuji with the wood grain across the mountain. My point is that that wasn't an intended point of it. It happened because when you got a new piece of wood and carved it and printed it, wood grain did transfer. But it wasn't part of the design. It wasn't intentional. Let's do this. There's maybe a, half, a handful of prints in all the history of Ukiyo where they tried to use wood grain. They're defects, they're defects. So someone's got a Vlad here, the implier. The point of view was shifting from utilitarian to artistic, and that's where it came in. The 20th century Sosaku people said, let's make art with this feature, of course. So and Rod sounds saying, yes, it could be beautiful, but my, my point is that simply it wasn't an intentional part of the design, that's all. So.
for me in the print we're making here, we don't have any intention of showing any wood grain in it at all. And if, if some does come out, it's sort of a quote unquote failure. second, don't worry, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic, but for one tiny second, it sounds counterintuitive actually, but it's much easier for me to control the strength this way, with this bigger persuader that it is to do that by hand. Just a sec, watch. That super hard piece of wood right there. I can do it this way with very little taps, and I know exactly what I'm gonna do. There's no danger at all of hitting that nearby line. But if I was trying to cut that by a chisel, if I had gone in there with this chisel, push, push, it would have been hard, it would have resisted. Push, push a bit harder, it would have been hard, it would resist push, push a bit too hard, and boom, out it goes, and all of a sudden, I would have a real chance of going too far. So for me, it was far safer. It looks counterintuitive, but it's safer at that point to bring in that big power tool and use its weight and inertia to slightly tap, tap a bit harder, tap a bit harder. There we go, there's the wood coming out. It was much safer to use that tool. We're not out of the woods, because this part here is also hard. And we're away safely. which zone to work on next then. This area is cleared out. I certainly don't want to do the face yet. I've got to get in better condition before I do the face. Let's just work down one of the arms or something here. There's another knot here. Look at this. There's another one.
It is dry. It is a good piece of wood. This is, this is a piece of wood that we've had hanging around for a long, 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 long time. I have no idea. I've had this piece of wood for decades. This is from Matsumura-san, maybe about 20 years ago. Again, we've talked about this in the stream a few, a few days ago. I didn't have a good big piece of wood enough for this print, so we have, I had a smaller piece left over from when I was making my Surimono albums. Those were all prints that had to fit inside an LP album size package. So I had some wood left over from that project from 20, 20 years ago, but it wasn't big enough for this whole plate. But the key block on this is only the central area, nothing outside. So I inlaid it into this piece of plywood. It's not going to take too many blocks. I think we're going to, for this whole surfer girl print, I think we're using four pieces of wood both sides. We're using eight faces. It's not an extremely complicated print. It's an interesting design, but the, the technical production, well, there are, there are some quirks and questions. We're, we're not 100% sure how to go through some of these things. But this is not an overly difficult, complex print. As long as we're careful with it. Some of the color overlaying. We'll talk about that when we get to the color separations. How to manage some of the color overlays is not obvious. We'll be working on that. But this is not a stunningly difficult print. No, 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 no. Somebody say 10. There's, there's nowhere near. It just doesn't have that many. The blues themselves, there are four layers of blue, blue green, teal. There are four layers of teal that go from bottom to top. We've got the four layers of teal. I think it would be easier to do it here, I guess. You can, you can perhaps see. There's the lightest teal, call it one. It goes up to number two. There's one and two. Here's one and two. And then farther along the line, here's a one and the, no, that's, there's four is the darkest one here. It comes back to three. That's three, that's four, that's three, that's three, that's two, that's one. So there's four layers of teal. There's a red, obviously. There's going to be a pink for the lips. There's going to be an overblock for the hair. There's going to be a base tone under the surfboard. There will be this, uh, you call it yellow, yellow tone on the surfboard. And then the surfboard overtones have to be split. There's got to be a block for the bottom half and a separate block for the top half because the bottom half has to be darker and it's also got to have that gradation, which you can see up here on the yellow. And then we chatted about it a little bit the other day. This textured pattern, I believe, was done on the first version, not carved. I believe it was done with heavy paste dragging a brush across the surface of the block. And we talked about that. It's going to be very, very difficult to get lots of them looking the same. So we may, still not decided, we may carve a pattern on three blocks. A base tone flat, a carved stripey pattern with a medium tone, and then a carved pattern for the third one. Undecided yet. We'll experiment with printing. And if we can reproduce this effect reliably and consistently, we'll do it with printing. If we can't, if we struggle and struggle and struggle, I'll just take the time and trouble and carve blocks for it. Then I don't, did we talk about it the other day? The, there's still an open question on how much overlay in these blue colors. I'm not sure if you can see it. If I zoom in, perhaps beyond what we can focus on. Let me try and focus here just for a sec. No, it's too close. No, we got to go out. We'll talk about it later. I'll get some close-up pictures for it. There are places in the darker blues where the lighter blue seems to peek out. And it gives the idea, looking at this, that there's a lighter blue under here with a darker blue on top. And it could be that this thing has been built with the light blue color, this one, and the zigzag border line could be one block all the way round, and that light blue may also go under all the other blue areas. So the light blue could be all the stripes that you see plus the ziggy zaggy block. And that would then have provided the base for the other blocks to be carved. 
There's a couple of mistakes in the original print, too. Do you see this? The outline comes down here. Ah, do more. Thank you. 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 Thank Too early to call. We'll decide what to do later. We'll decide what to do. No, we're not going to recreate mistakes. Never. I've never done that. I've never. There's another one here. It comes down. There's, there's a couple of factors. If we wanted to put, if we wanted to put the light blue under all of the darker blues, there's a plus and a minus. One is that we would have to carve all those things twice. So we carve all the surfing patterns, every single pattern, the wiggly, wavy patterns, this pattern, we carve it all on the lightest blue block. And then we have to carve again everything once more. The darker ones have to get carved again, lining up exactly. Over here, the darker patterns have to be carved again, lining up exactly. Down here, where they get really thin, they've got to line up exactly. And it looks to me here, can you see? It looks like they've done that, but it didn't line up exactly. Here's one again, look. I think we can see a lighter blue poking out from the edge of this darker one. So I think that's what they did. They carved lighter blue under all the blue areas, and then they, they laddered up on top with this. It's sort of backward from a reduction print. We're not going to do a reduction print. Imagine a reduction print, printing the darkest blue and then cutting back the block for the next one, cutting back the block for the next one. You could do it the other way around with a reduction print, which we're, of course, not going to do. So I don't know. The other downside of doing it that way with multiple blue blocks that overlay each other is for the printer, the registration has to be pinpoint perfect every time. Much more stress for the printers. So I am thinking that we're going to have four separate blue blocks that don't overlap. The lightest one would be just the lightest areas. The level two would be just the level two areas, and level three and level four. The downside there is that it's more difficult to get the density on the deep ones because they're just being printed once instead of being printed on an overlay. Anyway, there will have to be a decision, and that comes at the point when the key block is finished and I'm doing the color separations. And I would really, really, really like to see more copies of this print to be able to figure out how they did it. And I'm going to hunt around and try and find the largest reproductions I can find anywhere on the net to try and get some more clues about how that was made. What would Mr. Okada have wanted? Well, I met him, I know him, I talked about printmaking with him, and I've heard all the stories from the publisher about the Genji Monogatari print. He wants, he wanted wonderful, beautiful, gorgeous prints. The uh, 1970s Okada-san, who commissioned and who was part of the production of making those Genji Monogatari prints, was overbearing, demanding, I want more, I want more, I want more, it's not good enough, I want more, I want more, I want more, to the point where the publisher blew up and they cancelled the whole project, the moving forward to make more Genji prints. So yeah, I know that Okada-san was a demanding, sometimes not so friendly, whatever. He wanted, quote, the best by what he was thinking was the best. This Surfer Girl was made years earlier, before he was I don't know, more well known. And it was made by a very large company, uh, the Kodansha Company, sponsored and produced it, as far as I understand. So he would have had much less power there. So he may have just put the thing in, and they made it without his input, or he may have been part of the process. We have no knowledge of that, and he's gone now, and there's nobody left to tell those stories. I don't know. We're going to make a print as nice as we can. We're not going to cut any corners. We're going to make it as nice as we can, and when I make my decision next week about how to do the color separations, 
I'll consult with our printers and we will choose the method that will result in the best possible print we can make with the resources that we have available. And I have to say that that's always there and it's always true, but I do have to emphasize that because people don't get that. Outside people don't see that. We're okay, are we still? I don't hear any buzzers. 904, we're so good to go. What is show and tell today? I didn't actually. We have black folders everywhere. We'll find something in one of these black folders. I'm not quite sure the discussion there about using the same block for different colors. You know, there, there's lots of different ways to skin these cats. And there is a way that some modern printmakers work in that they would perhaps carve all those blue areas on one block. And then, for example, if they were using a, a non-water-based pigment, if they were using an oil-based pigment, they could roll it or put it on just this one and this one and this one and leave it off the other ones and then print that and you would have two tones. We can't fiddle around like that. On a block where there's two white areas, we can print it one color, print the second color on the other half. But we can't fiddle around in the middle and dibbling and dabbling and dibbling and dabbling. We've got to grab our brush and go bang, 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 bang. So there's no way we could do these blue things all on one block and get four different colors. We, we are going to have to have four plates one plate for the light blue, medium, medium, and dark. So that we can just print them, bang, and away we go. What's still flexible, what's still variable, is how much of those plates will overlap, how much, what areas will be carved on more than one of those blocks. The easiest, both for carving and for printing registration, is to carve four separate blocks 
that don't overlap. One block for the lightest blue, one for the next step, next step, next step. That way we don't have to carve everything twice. That way the printers don't have to worry about extreme microscopic registration because those blue areas are separated by spaces which will account for any slight misregistration. The only downside to doing it that way is it's certainly more difficult to get saturated rich color on the darker ones. But having said that, if it turned out that we were having trouble getting that saturation, then we simply take that darker block and we print that block twice. So print the light blue, looks good to me. Print the next medium blue, looks good to me. Print the next one, mm, it's not quite saturated enough. Do it twice. So in the, this is coming together in my mind. The idea is, I believe, to carve those four separate blue color blocks with no overlapping areas. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. It's difficult to explain, I'm sorry. I guess you guys have been trying to discuss this, I don't know, so whatever. There's lots and lots of ways to skin these cats. And you can see them when we're doing a reproduction like this of a print that's already been done and these decisions were already made once upon a time and some of them are visible in the finished print and some are not. You can then compare that with our situation with making our monthly prints when we are not making a reproduction but we're making a new print from scratch. So we're dealing with these issues at the primary level, you know, how will we do this? How will we solve this? Do we carve two blocks for that, one block for that? What should we do? And it's a different story when you're dealing with the issues as a, as a publisher for the first time around and when you're trying to make a reproduction of something that already exists. There's a constraint in the reproduction that isn't there in the original. here out there is the owner of the whale restaurant he's chatting with somebody he used to be our uh, <coughs> he used to be the manager of the block association the business association he's now retired from that but he's still very much part of the community of course he's out there every day chatting and talking and So it seems he's still actually sort of the, the, the dawn of the street was the word I used for him before. He doesn't have any uh, uh, legal power anymore, but he's certainly the, the go-to man for, for discussions out there. high profile person on the street. He's on TV still quite a lot. That whale restaurant still does get action from the uh, variety programs, less than it did some years back, because the whale thing now has, uh, has gone into the background. But, uh, but he does, because you know, of his associations with Beat Takeshi and stuff, he still gets uh, media attention. So. These days we're getting no media attention at all. The TV people have uh, completely forgotten about us, of course, because we're because we're out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> if the airport ever does open up again, we'll have to start making sure we get some more publicity moved up. Someone says, this is Dave Irish, I, not that I know of, but my mother did say something. One of the discussions I had with my mother, we were asking about that. 
are, as far as we know, our roots are just Yorkshire, Northern Britain. But she did say something. She said, you're, you're, uh, was it my grandfather on my mother's side? I can't remember. My mother's mother's father, is that the one? No, my father's mother's father was Irish or something. I'm sorry, I don't remember. It's, it's, a, it's something like that. And he was, they were saying, he had the most glorious voice and he had a BBC audition chance. I, I heard this story. She was in, when we were in the hospital time, the last couple of months. And she said, your life would have been different if he wasn't an old alcoholic. <laughs> what if? I'm like, yes, the story, it's, it's distorted. It's been told and distorted and I'm not even sure I really remember it. And it would be my, my father's mother's no my father's father's father that's right that's right that's why they got divorced my father's father's father he was he was a pub singer whatever he was in the pub every night whatever whatever and they had these singing things and he was noted for singing in the pub what a great voice wonderful 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 and I guess somebody heard him, some kind of scout heard him. This is the story as it has come down to me. Somebody said, yeah, you should be on the BBC. And didn't you know over in Manchester next week, there's a, there's a session where people can come and, and stand up and sing on the stage and the BBC will list to them and see if they're going to be, a, you know, like an open audition or something like this. And he was, they were saying, you go to it, go to it, go to it, you're going to win for sure. Go to it, go to it, go to it, win for sure. And he got on the bus and went over there that day. And it opened at 11 o'clock or something, whatever, or 12 o'clock, the audition started. And he says, before I go in there, I'm just gonna, you know, just wet my whistle, whatever. And you know the rest of the story, you know, they, they threw him out of the pub that night as he was drunk and he just drank too much and forgot the audition or didn't go to the audition or whatever, and that was the end of that. <laughs> so he crawls home and loses it. And the family story is, he was so good that he would have been a BBC star for sure. And our lives would be different and stuff like this. So. Whatever, I know, I have no idea what grain of truth is in there or none at all, I don't know. Look at this, you can see I got bit, this is from last weekend when I was in Ome. I spent a few hours in the afternoon, what was it, Sunday? I trimmed stuff and trimmed branches and stuff and I paid for it and I'm still paying for it a week later. I don't know what it is, it's not a mosquito, the mosquitoes don't do this to me, something, or it could be in the house, the old tatami mats where I was sleeping, they haven't been vacuumed in like 14 years, so, so I got bit by something out there last weekend, and it's going to take me a while to shake this off, so. <clears throat> Let's look at our black folder, you know. No, we didn't do a fish stream because the weather out there is too bad. Hopefully there will be a fish stream next week. The, the water today, there's been heavy, heavy rain. The water today is way up. We can't see into the water. There are no fish to play with. Okay, what we've got here, these are big. How am I going to do this? Okay, let me just show you first in oversized, then I'll pull them out of the folder. And we've been going through our black folder. This is the black folder with the stuff that Western people have sent me over the years, some friends. And this is an old, old folder, and there are newer stuff people have sent in previous year, recent years. This is the last page in that folder. Let me pull these out of here, and we'll have a look at this. These are from back in the days when the Baron Group was active. Is this? No, that's different. This is the same one. Okay. Let's have a look at this. The original Baron Group, it's from 1996 or 1997. It was. Uh, it was an email list, you know, they used to have a, a what, do you, what you would call a list serve back in the old days, whatever, just whatever. We passed around email messages to each other discussing woodblock printmaking. Uh, some people joined up who were just casual about it, some people joined up who were professionals. We just talked about woodblock prints. This is a young man, 
young man, whatever, it's a guy, whatever, I'm sorry, I don't even remember. This was, this is 2003, it says here. Somebody who had joined the list because he was interested in, in doing prints and stuff. His career, actually, I believe he was a lighting man on Broadway. Lighting or something like this. He was working... He was working on Broadway in the backstage with theaters. And he was actually, a, a, this is a full professional working in, in the backstage of Broadway shows. He had joined the Baron Group, and we did an exchange once where we set the size. It's got to be four by one. We sort of talked about this the other day. We talked about eight by one. The Baron Group set the size of a four by one, said everybody make a print and send it in. And Joe, Joe Sheridan, joined and, and started to do this. And he got really, really, really good at it. And from his, he was a complete hobby. He's working as a, as a lighting man backstage in, in, these, in these big shows, big career at that. And he started sending me the prints, saying, Dave, what do you think? What can I do? How do we do this? You know, and I, I would just like mumble and say, that's OK. And, and, and you know, you don't want to super criticize somebody. They're just trying to do a nice job. And there's really not much you can help somebody other than saying, well, maybe you could get a bit more saturation on the shadows or something like this, you know. The people have to do it by themselves. You can't teach what about printmaking. You can't put knowledge in somebody's head. You can just put samples out, and people that are good at figuring stuff out themselves will go ahead and figure it out. And this is some of Joe's, Joe's prints. This, there's one, two, three, four of them here, and they are very, very, very nicely done. I guess I've never heard his name since then. He didn't end up becoming a printmaker. He probably did the smart thing and kept his day job, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I've had no contact with him since, slightly after this. This is 2003, and I did have contact with him. I don't remember when it is. It would have been maybe three, four, five, six years after this. An email came from Joe and said, I'm in town. Our show, I'm, I'm working with the Broadway show such and such. I don't even remember what show it was. Oh, it was maybe the Cirque du Soleil, Soleil, whatever they call themselves at that time. He said, we're traveling, you want some tickets? And like, he arrived in Tokyo, phoned me up, and, and he gave me some tickets. We went down, and we were guests uh, uh, at, at one of the shows he was doing. And very, very nicely made. It's not great quality paper. This is not full, rich Iwano-san paper. And this is 20 years ago. I have no idea what kind of paper he's using, some kind of Japanese paper. And you can see, here we are, the same blocks and putting richer color in one place, a bit more richer color in another place. So what would have been a nice, normal, nothing wrong with it print, you can see by overlaying more colors, it starts to really, really get depth and come to life. Once you've got your block set ready, man, you can go to town and make all kinds of effects with it. This is 2005, two years later. Well, somebody's got him, stage manager. Okay, go for it. Somebody's got some information on Joe. I don't think we're doxing him here. I think Joe sent me these prints. He was public, uh, he was actively public in the Baron Forum at that time. So I don't think this is a terrible secret that we shouldn't be talking about online. I think this is uh, publicly information, publicly available information. Whether Joe is still doing this or not, I don't have the slightest idea. I've had no contact with him now in whatever, certainly more than 10 years, 10 or 15 years. It would be fun to think that he's still doing it and that he's now actually maybe making a living at this or something. That would be cool. Marin Headlines, San Francisco, proof copy, 2003. And I have no thing negative to all say about this at all. This is, for, for a person's early experiments, this is beautifully, beautifully, beautifully done. He clearly is the kind of person who can figure out what to do. There was no book available for him on what to do back here, but he was clearly the kind of person that could figure out what to do and go for it. It's just kind of similar to the first prints that Karen made, right? Is Karen commenting on this here? This is quite similar to Karen's uh, earlier work. Karen has now moved to a situation where she's making clearer, neater, cleaner prints, which is good or bad, I don't know. But this is something quite similar to that. 
What kind of ink is it? It's water-based pigments. That's all I know. I don't know what he's used. It could be water-based pigments in tubes, or it could have been powder pigment mixed with water. I don't know. And the paper is very badly sized. We have a, a hair, it's, it's feathering. So he didn't have access to a nice sheet of paper. And then look at this, look at this, look at this. And he has now moved ahead and he, by this time now, he's editioning these. It says 78 out of 100. So he must have been putting these in the market. This is a real print. He's copying the Hasui kind of idea for a signature. And a hundred copies of a print this big, I gotta tell you, that is one insane amount of work. And what I would have expected to see is maybe five over 100, meaning that it's a plan for 100, but like I've made five copies so far, but it's not. It says 78 over 100. So I guess he sat there and he trucked away doing it. We should do a reverse image search for Google and see if these are out there. I think if this was in the marketplace, if we had these, I think this would, uh, this would be an item. Very cool, very cool, very cool. Joe Sheridan, about whom now I know nothing more than what I'm able to tell you. He did send me a letter, we don't need to throw it in public, he says thank you letter, here's two of my prints, you know, lots of planning on each, I'm learning a lot as I go along, I would appreciate any help you might be able to offer on this, any secrets you might share about arriving at the proper color balances when proofing. I know I don't have any secrets at all. I have made many proofs of this image trying to get the balance and light correct. You and me both, Guy. <laughs> so I have no secrets at all. <laughs> Shinhanga is tough. Shinhanga is really tough, you know. <laughs> get in there, start digging it, digging into it, and get busy with your experiments. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. There is one more. We're going to do a folder. That is the last page. There must be one more. I guess I thought those were all Joe's prints. Let's pick one more. There is another one in that same folder here, the same page. This is not Joe, but it must come from that same, remember that same event I was saying. The Baron group was asked to make prints like this in a four by one group. And this is not Joe, but it's another member of the group at that time. This is also a lady I don't know well and can't tell you much about her name. It says here at the bottom is Carol Baker. And she would have been a member of the Baron Group at that time. And she's numbering also 31 of 40. And that would be because the Baron Group was probably doing an exchange. I think they had, you had to send in 30. So she must have made an exchange, uh, a group of 40. And this is an example too you can, if, of how you can create such a beautiful effect with such a simple thing. Like what she's got here, two green blocks to show. One green block for the base and the mountains, uh, the, the base and the islands. Then another green block for the trees and the island shadows. So two green blocks. One blue base and then one or maybe two shadow blocks. You could carve this in, in a couple of hours and then the, the amount of variations on the printing you could do would be infinite, absolutely infinite. On a print like this, once the conception is done, the carving job is, is just meaningless. Just cut it out, cut it out. The carver is not bringing any detail to these lines, beautiful carving taste, like Ito-san or something, no. This one, it's all in the printing. People, get with this. If you're thinking about trying this, look at some of these examples. I can't say, I mean, it's an insult to Carol. Anybody can do this is not what I mean. My point is that the barriers to doing this are low. You can get some wood, sketch on it, cut some stuff, get some watercolor pigments from the drugstore. Anybody can try this. 
If I were doing another book, your first print, I would do it this way instead of what I did with my original book. I went into line cutting and stuff, which was a huge barrier for people. I would start this way. This is how Matt Brown starts people. They cut a couple of masses, they print it, and people are all, oh my God, there's a sunset. You can do it, you can do it. Don't promote my book here, because it doesn't talk about how to do this. Go and look at Matt Brown's work, ulupress.com. Go over there and look. Matt will show people how to do these prints. And I, again, I, I, I want to say both things. I want to say anybody can do it. That's an insult to Carol. She's done a very nice job here. It's not anybody can do it, but anybody can try it. Anybody can try it. If you get stuck, write to Karen there. She knows how to do this. She's been through this. Karen started with something like this, and now she's making beautiful, beautiful, beautiful prints. Is Karen's print still here? Yeah. Hey, it's still here. This is the one Karen is making. She's in the stream here, one of our mods. And this is where she's got to. Karen, how many prints? Is this, it's not your third print, fourth print, fifth print. How many, Karen son? Can you tell us? Is this your, your tenth design or something? I don't have any idea at all. Ten. So Karen is guessing maybe this is her tenth print, starting with something. I don't know her history. Starting with something kind of similar to this and working up. Here, and she's gone to an approach with no, no outlines, just masses of color. And it's not so easy, anybody can do it, try this and tomorrow you'll be as good as Karen. It's not like that, but you know what my point is? Try it. <laughs> try it, try it, try it. Karen, why don't you write a book? You can do it now. Write a book explaining how to do this kind of print. I'm, I'm, I'm busy, I'm busy. Okay, I, I'm out of here. Uh, I am going to Ome tomorrow to get my shot, because even though it's raining, I still have to get my shot. So I'm out of here Sunday noon on the train to Ome, get my shot in Ome, my fourth vaccine, and then come back on the train. I'll be sleeping here Sunday night. So Monday morning, our next stream is scheduled for Monday morning. If the shot thing happens with no after effects, and if I'm totally okay Monday morning, we will have a stream two days from now. If I wake up Monday morning or during the night and things are not going well, I will send a note to one of the mods saying, I'm dying, I'm finished, I can't do this, and we will not have a stream Monday. So let's do this on a standby basis. I fully intend to be here, but given that I have a vaccination the night before, it's possible I won't be. The AMA has been decided, it's happening Two weeks from now, it's on a Thursday stream. It's one of our Thursday streams, <coughs> and it'll be this Thursday stream two weeks from now. I don't remember. I gotta get a note ready so we can talk about it. Anyway, I'm out of here. Thank you very much for watching. It's been a bit of a mixed stream today. Got some work done. Hopefully only a sore arm. My arm is still sore from the first booster. I still have trouble lifting my arm over my head from the first booster six months ago. So I am a bit nervous about this. Not nervous about the vaccination aspect of it. Nervous about the way they stick it in your arm. Anyway, enough. Thanks very much. I'll see you maybe in a couple of days. Maybe it'll be a bit longer than that this time around. Thanks for watching and bye for now.